Okay. I'm going to go ahead and call this uh, special assembly meeting to order. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Mr. Rivera? Present. Ms. LaFrance? Here. Mr. Thompson? Here. Mr. Dunbar? Was excused. Mr. Peterson? Present. Mr. Dyson? Here. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Here. Ms. Kennedy? Here. Mr. Welton? Here. Mr. Perez Vereda? Also excused. Ms. Salta? Here. Jerry Yokohan? Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, Ms. Salta, can you please leave us in the porch? Item 4A, status of litigation regarding the court, Marin and Henry. Uh, it's my understanding that we have a short uh, public briefing on the court. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Bill Falsi, the Anchorage Municipal Manager. This will be, a, I think, a fairly extensive public briefing. We anticipate that the Assembly may wish to move into executive session to talk about strategies and uh, other items specifically related to the Marad lawsuit, but we've prepared a presentation which will be mostly available to the public. Actually, every slide will be available to the public. I'll turn it over to Bob Owens. We'll turn it over to our outside counsel, who is WebExing in from Washington, D.C. At the risk of abusing the baton being handed to me, I will say two new things. They're not directly related to the Marad litigation, but which seem relevant. So if I could have the clerk turn off the lights. Um, we got our first look under the docks since the earthquake very recently. And just uh, two slides of pictures, some stuff that we had seen before. So we saw a bunch of port piles that are full of water and spitting, and some longitudinal cracks running up port piles. But having told you we saw some things we already seen before, we saw a few things that we had not seen before. And that is, it's a little hard to see there, cracks that are going almost all the way to the top of the platform, or actually in some cases to the top of the platform. And then this new character of pile failure, which looks a lot like, uh, I think, of a Pillsbury Crescent Roll dough uh, tube being cracked open. That feels like earthquake damage to us. Uh, and in fact, you need a little bit of sense of scope. You can stick your finger right in there. That pile is probably not doing anything at this point. Um, so we're keeping a close eye on that, and we're asking the engineers to tell us what uh, their best guess is of what that has done. Uh, disturbingly, this is in one of the newest parts of the port. This is in the petroleum oil lubricants Two, which is, we think, 1978. So uh, we're keeping an eye on that. The other is um, the Assembly should be aware that we have put an invitation to bid out for the first season of the Petroleum Cement Terminal. The 2020 scope is on the street. It is available to everybody uh, on the purchasing website. We have put that out for 45 days. We're anticipating that we'll come back to the Assembly in June which we know tees up a lot of discussion between now and June uh, about being comfortable with this idea or not. Um, so for May, we're certainly uh, going to be pitching to the Assembly to have a lot of conversation about this. But with that, I will now do the role I was actually asking that form and hand it over to Bob Owen. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Bob Owens. I am an assistant municipal attorney. And I wanted to, I'm going to be introducing uh, co-counsel, our outside attorneys, but just as a little bit of background, I was first involved with the, the Port of Anchorage litigation and the problems that arose in August of 2010. I got a phone call that there was going to be a telephonic meeting to address concerns about uh, the Corps of Engineers being concerned about the spillage of soil and gravel into in the Cook Inlet that was threatening a possible <coughs> criminal fi uh, fines against the, the municipality. First time I'd heard of the word sinkhole and the like. The phone call had a lot of people in D.C. I'd never heard of, some local people, and that's how it got started. We flash forward to December of 2010, and there was a meeting at the port where Marad brought people in from D.C. and their principal contractor, who was called ICRC, was there, as well as local uh, port people and municipality, the municipality, the manager, the port director, and the like. 
It was during that meeting that the, pe the port people, the city people, learned that ICRC, the project manager slash design man, uh, builder, <coughs> had issued a letter to the contractors demanding repairs that were estimated to cost in excess of $35 million. We knew nothing about any of that. And uh, it was an eye opener. In that same meeting, I learned that the prime contractor had filed a lawsuit in federal court against the pile driver, and the pile driver had filed a lawsuit in state court against the prime contractor. And so there was litigation going on, there was demands back against the contractors, and we were just being informed of all this. Over the next several months, we attempted to work with NARAV to resist the claims by the contractor. ICRC ended up switching positions and joined the contractors in a claim for extra compensation. Uh, and it became very clear that, the, that I couldn't handle this litigation the way it was going, and we were gonna need help. So it was at that point in about May of 2012 that we did a national invitation and got a number of uh, highly qualified local and national law firms that um, we did a whole process and ended up selecting Seifarth Shop. They've been working with us now for in excess of six years. I think there's been a couple of grandchildren, several children born in the course of this project. And uh, they've been exceptionally uh, qualified and skilled in representatives. So um, I'll turn it over to Jason Smith, who's on the phone. He's controlling the PowerPoint. And I'll let him fill you in on what's going on with the case. Can everybody hear me OK? Yes. Excellent. And you can, uh, you can see the PowerPoint presentation? We can. All right, excellent. Uh, all right, well, thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. Um, and, and Mr. Chairman, members of the Assembly, uh, my name is Jason Smith. I have been outside litigation counsel for the municipality on these lawsuits uh, since the very first case was filed in March of 2013. I am currently the lead outside attorney for the claim against the Maritime Administration, uh, and that claim is proceeding uh, quite well and probably scheduled to go to trial hopefully sometime before the end of the year. Um, I was asked to provide a presentation to the assembly uh, regarding several issues and um, I'll just go over a few of the things that I'd like to cover uh, this afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to provide just a, a little bit more uh, than what Bob provided on the project background. I'd like to talk about some of the issues that arose uh, in 2010 when we first learned of them uh, that ultimately resulted in litigation. I, I want to provide an update on the municipality's litigation position. <clears throat> um, that position has not changed at all since 2013 when the original claim was filed uh, against the what I'll refer to as the private parties. Uh, and I'll refer to that lawsuit as the private party lawsuit. But what I'm referring to that is the U.S. District Court for the District of Alaska claim against the individual entities who are responsible for the design and construction of the Port of Anchorage Intermodal Expansion Project. And I'll identify each of those individual entities for you uh, here in a few minutes. And then finally, I, I'd like to provide just a very brief uh, status update on the lawsuit that is pending against the Maritime Administration, uh, as well as provide you with my best guess on when I think that case is ultimately gonna go to trial. So with that, um, a little bit about the project background. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, this is an aerial photograph from 2004. This is pre-Port of Anchorage Intermodal Expansion Project. Uh, you can see highlighted in red, uh, POL1 and POL2, which are the existing terminals at the Port of Alaska, then the Port of Anchorage. Um, in 2004, there was a clear need to update and replace the existing facilities at the Port of Alaska, and there was a need for some additional space at the port in order to accommodate uh, additional laydown area as well as some additional berthing facilities. 
And so several designs were considered that would allow for the port to reclaim some of the tidal areas, tidal flats, to the north and south of the existing op uh, port operations uh, to allow for some additional acreage to be created and to allow for some additional uh, berthing to be uh, created at the port. And so um, ultimately what came out of that idea was the Port of Anchorage Intermodal Expansion Project. And the real driving thought behind that was the idea to not only replace the existing facilities uh, but to create, again, some additional acreage. And the way it was going to work was that um, additional uh, land would be created starting in the very northern part of the project, and you can see the phasing plan for the Port of Anchorage Intermodal Expansion Project on your screen. Uh, but in early 2008, the idea was that uh, the dry barge berth, which is the northernmost part of the project, would be commenced uh, and begin construction there and then move south through the wet barge berth and then into um, the north extension. North replacement would be the area that would replace uh, what was existing at the time uh, and then some additional expansion would take place in the south replacement as well as the south extension and some additional work uh, would be done in the south backlands. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the work that was actually done and was actually contracted for for this project, uh, we refer to as the North Expansion Project. The North Expansion Project encompassed both of the barge berths, the dry barge berth, and the North Extension. The North Extension, just from a phasing standpoint, was subdivided into two separate parts, which you'll see referred to as any one and any two. Any one is the northernmost part of the north extension, and any two is the southernmost <coughs> part that connects up or would have connected up with the north replacement. Uh, in addition, there was some other work that was performed in the south backlands. There's really no issue or any need to discuss the south backlands work. That work was successfully performed in 2007 through 2009. Um, before I get into the specifics on the project, I want to talk a little bit about the way the project was set up contractually. Uh, the municipality of Anchorage obviously was the owner of the project. We entered into two separate agreements with the Maritime Administration, one in 2003 and one in 2011, pursuant to which the Maritime Administration agreed to serve as the lead federal agency for this project. Uh, what that means as a practical matter is that Merritt agreed to hold all of the design and construction contracts and to essentially deliver to the municipality a completed project. In order to facilitate that, the Maritime Administration entered into a contract, actually two separate contracts, one in 2003 and one in 2008, uh, with ICRC. ICRC was to serve as the program manager slash design builder. Uh, ICRC in turn was responsible for going out and entering into all of the individual trade contracts for the design and construction of the project. Uh, now one thing I, I would like to make the assembly aware of, the 2008 contract between ICRC and Marad is what is referred to as an award fee contract that contemplated the ability for ICRC to earn additional compensation if it performs successfully under the contract. And the reason why that's important is because, as we'll see here in a little bit, during the course of discovery in the current lawsuit, we've been able to obtain from the Maritime Administration uh, copies of some of those award fee evaluations, and we've been able to develop a better sense of just how much Merit understood uh, about what was going on on the project in 2008, 2009, and some of the problems that were taking place. Uh, but with respect to contractual relationships, ICRC entered into contracts with Terracon for geotechnical investigations, uh, entered into a contract with P&D to actually serve as the engineer of record for the project to develop the design. P&D in turn entered into contracts with VECO and geoengineers to assist with the design process. Uh, in addition, in 2008, ICRC entered into a subsequent contract with P&D uh, pursuant to which P&D actually performs construction administration services for the, for the project. 
uh, meaning that P and D actually had inspectors on site on a daily basis monitoring and inspecting the work that was performed by the contractors. And those contractors originally were QAP and MKB. QAP and MKB uh, were the contractors who were originally responsible for constructing the open cell sheet pile bulkhead at the project. Uh, ultimately, that contract was de-scoped, and in 2010, a subsequent contract was entered into with West Construction Company, uh, which originally contemplated taking over the work QAP and MKB had performed and finishing out the ins installation of the OCSP system in the North Expansion. Um, as you can see from this diagram of contractual relationships, the municipality did not have any contractual relationship with any of the designers or contractors on this project. MARAD held all of those contracts. And that presented some unique challenges for us uh, when this project went south and we ultimately had to initiate litigation against the individual designers and contractors. And I'll talk about some of those challenges uh, here in a few minutes. The, um, the design that was ultimately selected for this project is referred to as an open cell sheet pile design. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail on the engineering aspects of the design, but um, in simple terms and in, in sort of layman's terms, the way that it's constructed is that sheet piles are driven into the water in a semicircular fashion to create the face walls and then additional sheet piles are driven back horizontally from the face sheets uh, to create what are called tail walls. Uh, the tail walls serve to help stabilize the overall cells uh, by taking the load from the front and pushing it back and then using soil friction in order to stabilize the overall system. Um, the open cell sheet pile is a patented design helped by PND engineers. Uh, although it is somewhat similar to a mechanically stabilized earth wall, uh, and it is very similar to what's referred to as an open cell coffer dam. Uh, coffer dams are circular cell structures that are very commonly used uh, in the engineering community, and this one just happens to have one of the two ends removed uh, in order to effectuate easier fill of material. Uh, once the cells are are constructed fill material is placed behind the completed cells in order to create new land. Uh, and so it's a method that's used to create some uh, new land out of the water. The, um, the cells are connected at what are referred to as Ys, W-Y-E. Uh, the Ys are connection points that allow the cells to connect together to create a contiguous system. Uh, and that is important because <clears throat> when the system is installed, uh, both the interlocks, what are referred to as interlocks, but where the individual sheet piles connect to one another and where the cells connect together at the Ys have to be carefully installed in order to prevent what's called unzipping, uh, which can allow fill material, as, uh, as Bob Owens uh, discussed, to, to spill out into Cook Inlet, which can create problems with compliance with the Clean Water Act. The, um, some images, I want to show the assembly some images of what this looks like just to get a better sense for it. Uh, you can see on the left hand side, uh, this is what the open cell sheet pile system looks like as it's being constructed. You can actually see uh, there's some sheet pile being driven, uh, but the sheet pile again is driven to create these semicircular cells with the tail walls extending horizontally from the back. Uh, and then earth is actually pushed into the cells in order to create the new land. The, um, the construction method that was originally proposed for this project uh, was a landside construction method and so in 2007 some earthen dikes were created behind where the cells were going to be constructed in order to allow pile driving equipment to sit on top of those dikes and actually drive the pile into the water uh, from those earthen dikes. Uh, unfortunately that ultimately ended up proving to be an, an unsuccessful method of construction. The, uh, the image on the right is an image of one of the Y locations I mentioned. You can see how these uh, cells are constructed and the method that's used to keep them together, to interlock the cells uh, together with one another. The, um, the north extension, which was one of the primary areas that was going to be constructed as part of the north expansion project, 
is actually an 89-foot tall structure. Uh, so essentially it's a nine-story structure. So what you ultimately end up with is almost like a nine-story retaining wall uh, out at the port of, of Alaska, and you can get a sense for just how big this structure is uh, from this. Uh, but it's obviously, it's a, it's a very large scale project. Uh, and at the time it was constructed, it was the largest uh, and most uh, um, unprecedented use of this particular technology. So I want to talk about um, some of the issues that came up during the course of the project. Um, the, uh, the bulkhead construction started in June of 2008 uh, when the discharge permit was awarded from the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, QAP and MKB began constructing the structure at the northernmost point of the project, the dry barge berth. Uh, dry barge berth was actually successfully completed. There are no major issues with that portion of the project, the smallest uh, in scale portion of that project. And so that was completed in 2008. QAP and MKB started some work in the wet barge berth in 2008, uh, but then ultimately construction stopped to allow uh, for winter stabilization. In, um, in May of 2009, when construction recommenced and QAP started making progress south on the project through the wet barge berth, uh, MKB and QAP started experiencing some, some pretty significant hard driving conditions and were starting to have some pretty significant difficulty getting sheet pile into the ground. Since P&D had been awarded a construction administration contract to help oversee uh, the construction work on the project, and since P&D was the engineer of record for this project, ICRC reached out to P&D to solicit some recommendations on how to ease these hard driving conditions and allow the contract to install sheet pile uh, into the ground as required. Uh, P&D developed an extensive list of different options uh, that would allow for the sheet pile to be installed uh, unfortunately, none of those options was successful, and the contractor continued to have difficulty with sheet pile installation uh, throughout the course of 2009. In about October of 2009, uh, ICRC came to the conclusion that QAP and MKB were not going to be able to complete the bulkhead construction as required under their contract. And ICRC made the recommendation to the Maritime Administration that the balance of the bulkhead work be de-scoped from QAP's contract to allow ICRC to award that scope of work to a new contractor, uh, who at the time ended up being West Construction. Uh, Marad agreed to accept ICRC's recommendation and a decision was made in late 2009 to go ahead and de-scope the balance of the bulkhead work from QAP's contract and in early 2010, a follow-on contract was awarded to West Construction to complete the balance of the bulkhead construction in the North Expansion Project. So to complete what was left in the wet barge berth as well as the North Extension. Uh, West mobilized to the site and started installing some additional sheet pile and quickly came to the conclusion when it attempted to tie into what was out of the project uh, that there was such an expansive amount of defective construction work uh, that it simply could not perform any additional bulkhead installation. And so West Construction actually made the request to ICRC early in 2010 that its contract be terminated for convenience. And ultimately, ICRC uh, didn't recommend or accept that recommendation, uh, but West's contract was converted from a fixed fee contract into a time and materials contract, and the scope of work that West was originally tasked to do was changed, and West became responsible for assisting PND and ICRC uh, with investigating the construction work that was performed by QAP and MKB to try and identify just how extensive the damage was at the project site. Uh, and as we'll see on the following slides, the investigation revealed that there was just an incredible amount of damaged sheet pile at the project site and that those defects uh, with the installation work were really quite dramatic. 
And so as 2010 progressed and West Construction started pulling sheet piles in order to stabilize the site and what was out there, um, we started to see unzipped sheet piles, sheet piles that had the ends uh, that were bent as a result of poor installation work, uh, sheet piles that were twisted and damaged beyond repair. Uh, we, we began to see uh, sheet piles that had become unzipped at the toe of the installation where the embedment was supposed to occur. Uh, when these things become unzipped, as we'll see here in a few slides, that will allow fill material to spill into Cook Inlet uh, and resulted in the formation of sinkholes. And the defects not only were extensive, uh, but the defects in the construction were, were pretty incredible. Uh, the twisting of the sheet piles suggested that the sheet piles had been um, had been hit so many times uh, that they were completely unsalvageable. And you can see um, just how badly these sheet piles were twisted and how extensive the damage was uh, from the improper construction work. Uh, as I indicated, the unzipping of the sheet piles resulted in some pretty dramatic sinkholes forming behind the wall of the sheet pile structure. Uh, those sinkholes developed uh, primarily in North Extension 2, but in other areas of the project as well. And you can see some images of some of those sinkholes here. One of the most dramatic sinkholes developed in about September of 2010. Uh, the sinkhole was so deep that it actually filled with water and allowed some of the Jersey barriers that had been put up in order to maintain the safety of those working out there to, to fall into it. Uh, it was about this point of time when the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers issued a letter to the municipality demanding that the site be stabilized and some of these um, sinkhole issues be remediated uh, because we were potentially in violation of the Clean Water Act by allowing spill material to spill into navigable waters in Cook Inlet. At P&D's request in 2009 and 2010, some dive inspections were conducted in order to try and see how much damage there might be at the bases and the tail walls of the sheet piles that had been installed. Uh, and as you can see, the damage was quite extensive uh, as discovered by the divers during the dive inspection. Uh, as indicated in the report, the damage was present at every cell at base sheets or Ys at wet barge burst cells 27 to 38, and wet barge burst cells 36 to 38 were actually removed, and excavation was done at the tail wall locations and damage to tail walls was discovered. In the north extension, cells 9 through 12, 31 and 32 were removed and found to have damage at both the face and, and tail wall sheet locations and damage was present at cells 41 to 66 in the north extension that was spread throughout that entire location. Um, because of the discovery of this widespread damage, um, we asked in discovery for some of the award fee evaluations that predated 2010 to try and get a sense of what Marriott's involvement was in this process. And what we discovered when we obtained that information in discovery and litigation was that Marriott was concerned about ICRC's performance even in 2009 before the full extent of the damage had been discovered. And so what Marriott says in connection with its award fee evaluation in 2009 uh, is sort of stating the obvious, but QAP's subcontract was not completed successfully, program management has been unacceptable, schedule has not been met or our cost controls effective. Merritt indicated that ICRC's inability to properly manage their subcontracts is a major weakness and went on to say that while some activities had been completed successfully, the project as a whole had not been implemented appropriately. In addition, Merritt noted that ICRC had failed to implement and manage the bulkhead construction, which negatively impacted the program performance and that ICRC had generally failed to implement an appropriate quality control system for the project. So Marriott had concerns even in 2009 about the way this project was going, uh, but of course the full extent of the damage and the full extent of, of uh, what had happened out of the project wasn't apparent to the municipality until 2010. 
Um, as, as a result of these issues that were discovered in 2010, the municipality made the decision in conjunction with MARAD to suspend the project at the end of the construction season in 2010. Uh, MARAD entered into what's called an interagency agreement with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to allow the Army Corps of Engineers to hire an independent engineer to investigate the design and construction work and to make determinations about the best path forward for the project. The Army Corps of Engineers actually had at its disposal a list of pre-approved firms who were capable of doing this work. And so the Army Corps reached out to the individual firms on their pre-approved list and sought um, uh, proposal submissions from those firms. Three firms uh, responded to the request and actually made presentations to the Army Corps, Merritt, and the municipality and ultimately the Army Corps Merit elected to enter into a contract with CH2M Hill uh, for CH2M Hill to do the independent analysis, uh, which was performed under the supervision of the Army Corps Engineer Research Development Center. And I'll have a little bit more to say about URDIC uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, CH2M Hill did a comprehensive investigation of the design and construction work at the Port of Anchorage uh, over the course of more than a year. That investigation included going out and taking additional soil samples, performing additional laboratory testing on soils at the project site, and ultimately concluded with a final suitability study being issued in 2013. Uh, among the findings that CH2M Hill made as part of the suitability study uh, were specific findings with respect to both the wet barge berth and North Extension 1 and 2. Uh, you can see highlighted some of the specific conclusions that CH2M Hill reached, but one of the primary conclusions uh, was that the factor of safety, and factor of safety, um, so everybody is aware, is a term that is used by engineers to numerically state uh, whether or not a structure has sufficient a resistance capacity to meet the demands that are placed on that structure. The, um, the factors of safety are expressed numerically. Factor of safety of one, which is not something anybody would design a structure to meet, but a factor of safety of one essentially means that a structure has the same amount of resistance as demand. And so this structure was intended to, both contractually and per industry standard, it was intended to be designed to a factor of safety of 1.5 in a static state. Uh, CH2M Hill, in its analysis, concluded that the factor of safety in the static state for the wet barge berth was 1.22, and for North Extension 2 was 1.13, which is dramatically below the required factor of safety of 1.5. Uh, the result of which meant that when the structure was subjected to earthquake loads, uh, the potential for displacement and, and possibly collapse was pretty significant. And so CH2M Hill went on to conclude that the wet barge berths any one and any two do not meet the original static or seismic criteria when the overall global stability of the structure is taken into consideration, that the wet barge berth and any two are irreparable from a construction perspective, and if they could be repaired, they would not have the necessary factor of safety for global stability. The H2M Hill also concluded that the OCSP system is inadequate relative to global stability and seismic displacements based on the PIEP design criteria, and ultimately concluded that with the exception of the dry barge berth, everything that had been installed at the Port of Anchorage through the North Expansion Project needed to be reconstructed using a suitable design. CH2M Hill was not the only entity that Marriott engaged to analyze the project. Marriott entered into a separate contract with AEOCOM to perform what's called a root cause analysis. Uh, Marriott attempted to withhold all of this documentation from us, uh, but we went to court and got an order from the judge requiring Marriott to produce the AECOM results. Uh, AECOM analyzed, again, the construction and specifically the project management work that was performed by Marad and ultimately reached many of the same conclusions that CH2M held it. 
And so what we are left with is a general consensus um, that the design and construction work that was performed as part of the Port of Anchorage Intermodal Expansion Project are defective and are not suitable. Uh, as I indicated earlier, CH2M Hill's work was performed under the supervision of the experts at the Engineer Research Development Center. Uh, the Burdick Center is a center that was created by the Army Corps of Engineers to solve the nation's most challenging problems in civil and military engineering. Burdick is comprised of about a thousand engineers and scientists, 28 percent of whom have doctoral degrees and 42 percent of whom have master's degrees. The experts at Burdick uh, were involved in CH2 Hill's analysis throughout the duration of that investigation. The Erdic experts looked at CH2M Hill's conclusions as they were made, looked at the laboratory testing and soils analysis that was performed by CH2M Hill, and reviewed CH2M Hill's conclusions and ultimately concurred with those conclusions. Uh, in addition, AECOM agreed with many of the same conclusions that CH2M Hill reached. Now, when the municipality received CH2M Hill's suitability study in 2013, it didn't just accept that study, it actually did what any prudent owner should do and went out and hired an independent engineering firm to analyze CH2M Hill's report and to make a determination as to whether or not CH2M Hill had appropriately analyzed the design and construction work and whether or not the conclusions were accurate. The firm that the municipality hired is Simpson, Gumpert, and Hager. SGH did a thorough analysis of CH2M Hill's investigation uh, and ultimately issued a letter to the mayor in which SGH indicated they conclude, or they agreed, excuse me, uh, with CH2M Hill's investigation and its conclusions that the design is not appropriate for this project and that the design and all the work that was performed uh, needs to be removed and the site stabilized. Uh, I and the others who are serving as outside litigation counsel for the municipality have subsequently engaged SGH to serve as a litigation expert in both cases. Uh, SGH has continued to analyze this design and the construction work that was performed and maintains to this day that the design is not appropriate for the project and that what is installed at the Port of Alaska needs to be removed and replaced. In addition, we have also retained the services of Dr. Timothy Stark. Dr. Stark is a professor of geotechnical engineering at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. Dr. Stark has analyzed the soil conditions at the Port of Anchorage. He has also reviewed SGH's structural analyses and many of the investigative work that SGH performed, as well as the work of CH2M Hill. And Dr. Stark has also concluded that both the design and construction work at the Port of Anchorage are defective uh, and need to be removed and the site stabilized. With that background, I'd like to talk about what the municipality's litigation position is. And the first thing I'd like to make clear to the assembly is our position uh, in the litigation has not changed since the original lawsuit was filed against the private parties in 2013. And that position is that the open cell sheet pile design is not suitable for the Port of Alaska. And that both the design defects and the construction defects render the open cell sheet pile that has been installed at the Port of Alaska entirely unusable. It is our position and remains our position that all of the open cell sheet pile, with the exception of the dry barge berth, has to be removed and that that site needs to be cut back and stabilized in order to make it safe. Uh, with respect to the individual parties that we have brought suit against, it is our position that Merritt and ICRC failed to properly manage and correct design and construction de deficiencies. Merritt had a contractual right to require both the designers and the contractors to correct the defects at the project site and no cost to the municipality and elected not to do that. With respect to the private party engineers and designers, it is the municipality's position that the soil conditions were not appropriately investigated that they did not provide a suitable design, 
and that many of the issues that have been subsequently uncovered with respect to the design should have been caught during the independent review process and that the issues that were caught during the independent review process were not appropriately corrected before construction was allowed to proceed. With respect to the contractors, it is the municipality's position that the contractors failed to appropriately perform their construction work, that sheet piles were not appropriately installed at the site, and that that resulted in widespread construction defects. In addition, we have additional claims against the Maritime Administration. We contend that the Maritime Administration failed to properly ensure the project risks, failed again to correct, correct the, or require corrective work, <clears throat> failed to pursue its rights under surety bonds that were provided by the individual contractors who performed work on this project, and that mayor had breached its agreement with the municipality by actually settling claims with the contractors using the municipality's money and without our knowledge and consent. I'd like to talk quickly about the private party litigation and specifically why it is that the municipality made the decision to settle that claim. Um, as I indicated at the very beginning of this presentation, the municipality did not have any direct contractual relationship with the designers or contractors who performed work on the project. Because of that, we could not bring breach of contract claims against those individuals and instead had to rely on negligence theories and professional negligence theories. Um, unfortunately, negligence and professional negligence theories present some specific legal hurdles that make those claims much more difficult to proceed with. Uh, we knew that when we filed that claim, uh, but nevertheless, we felt it was important to hold the individual entities responsible for the design and construction defects responsible, and so we went ahead and pursued those claims uh, knowing that there would be difficulty in getting past some of those legal hurdles. Um, ultimately, we were limited in what we could recover in that case, and we were limited primarily because of some actions that the Maritime Administration took. Uh, as I indicated earlier, the Maritime Administration went ahead and settled claims that had been filed by ICRC and the contractors. Merritt paid additional money to those entities. That money was not the federal government, it was the municipalities, and they did it without us knowing about it. Um, and they also provided those entities with releases. Um, those releases resulted in those entities uh, letting insurance policies that were provided for this project lapse. It also resulted in the extinguishment of the surety rights that we had. The contractors actually had provided a $100 million surety bond for this project, and Merad's actions in settling those claims and releasing the contractors uh, resulted in our inability to pursue those surety bonds at all. Uh, ICRC had the primary insurance policy for the project. ICRC allowed that policy to lapse after receiving a release from the Maritime Administration, and we were not able to pursue any claims under that insurance policy. Uh, in addition, when the project was being uh, created and contracts were being entered into, Merritt did not appropriately require insurance of the individuals who were providing work on this project. For example, P&D, who was the engineer of record for this project, only had a $1 million E&O policy. E&O policies have eroding limits, which means that defense costs come out of the policy amount, and so the longer litigation continued, the less insurance money was available uh, from P&D's policy to settle the claim. And so ultimately, what ended up happening when we looked at the economics of the situation was that we believed there was a very high possibility we would proceed to trial against the individual parties, that we would prevail, and that the municipality would have no mechanism to collect on any judgment. As a result, the municipality made an economic decision to settle those claims, uh, to avoid having to try and get past legal hurdles, and to deal with the issue of not having sufficient insurance money, and instead to focus our efforts on the claims against the Maritime Administration, uh, where all of these issues do not exist, and where there is plenty of money to uh, collect in the event we are successful at trial. I want to be clear though, the municipality's decision to settle those claims was driven primarily by a lack of insurance. It was not 
driven at all uh, by anything that was uncovered during discovery. That all of the independent experts, as well as the Army Corps of Engineers and the Maritime Administration, stand by the conclusion that the open cell sheet pile design is defective and is not suitable for the Port of Anchorage. And the fact that the municipality settled those claims does not in any way change the municipality's litigation position. All right, I finally want to just quickly address the current lawsuit against the Maritime Administration. That lawsuit um, is reaching the final stages of completion. Uh, before I get to the status update, just a little bit about the specific claims. Again, it is our contention that the Maritime Administration breached its obligations to us and as a result is responsible for the damage we sustained at the port. And specifically, we contend that Marriott failed to properly assess the feasibility of the design, failed to ensure during design development that the open cell sheet pile system was suitable for the project, failed to ensure the proper construction of the open cell sheet pile system, failed to perform the obligations required of it as the administrative, uh, as the lead federal agency, and improperly settled with the contractors without the municipality's knowledge or consent and using the municipal's money. Um, we have proceeded through fact discovery. Uh, fact discovery has been complete. We took nearly 40 depositions in that case. I can confidently say, having taken all of those depositions, uh, that we feel very good about the way fact discovery shook out. Uh, we feel that we are very well placed in the litigation. Uh, we've already produced our expert reports in this case. The government's expert reports must be produced on May 6th. So in just a little over a week, we'll have the government's expert reports. Summary judgment motions are to be filed no later than June 6th. And given that current time frame and the court's requirement that summary judgment motions be fully briefed by June 6th, uh, it's my best guess that trial is likely to commence in the late fall this year. If I had to guess, I would, I would think trial is likely to commence in October of this year, uh, which means we should have trial wrapped up uh, by the end of this year. If for some reason trial gets pushed, I fully anticipate trial to start and be completed uh, in the first quarter of 2020 at the latest. So I think this case is going to quickly come to a, uh, come to a close uh, here either before the end of this year or early next year. Um, the judge in the case has made a request to come out and visit the project site. And so Judge Damage, who is presiding over this case, uh, will be in Anchorage in the first week of August to physically inspect the project site, uh, see the open cell sheet pile system that's been installed, and we'll have an opportunity to go out in the water and actually view the structure that's in place from the water side. Um, with that, I don't know how much more time we have in the public session, but I'm, I'm available to answer questions if there are any. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Dyson. Uh, thank you. Uh, did the analysis show that the geotechnical information on the <coughs> ground they were trying to drive in was faulty? Um, yes, we believe that some of the early geotechnical work that was performed at the project site was not um, performed, well, first of all, it was not performed along the entire length of the wharf, and so some of the areas where hard driving conditions were experienced, uh, there should have been soil samples taken and there were not. Um, some additional soil sampling was done by P&D in 2008, and some additional cyclic tests, which are ways to measure the response of the soil under earthquake loading were performed. Those results were inconsistent with some of the early analysis, and so yes, we believe uh, some of the early soils analysis and investigation was not properly performed. And then <clears throat> what part of the conclusion that the design faulty and that it was difficult, if not impossible, to drive that kind of sheet piling into those soils? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dyson. Mr. Constant. I would just note that you've got a simple one-word answer to your question, which is highly unusual. So, um, two questions. What kind of trial are we having? Is it in front of a judge, jury? What does that look like? In 
What? How much are we asking for? What's What's the claim that we're demanding? The um, in the we're because we have asserted a claim against the federal government. We are in the court of federal claims. The court of federal claims is somewhat of a unique court. Uh, in that it has national jurisdiction and also that it does not provide for trial by jury. And so we will be trying this before judge damage. It'll be a bench trial. Uh, the total amount of claim damages stands uh, somewhere around $300 million. I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but I, I believe it's about $320 million. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any further questions for Mr. Smith? Yes, Mr. Johnson. So is that 300 plus million, uh, does that cover attorney fees and lost opportunity fee uh, costs? It does not. That is, um, that is loss of dollars that were spent by the municipality uh, as well as loss of use of federal funds that were earmarked specifically for this project as well as the cost to stabilize the site and remove what has been installed at the project. And did it, does it include the cost for us of litigating this case? Uh, it does not. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Dyson. Can I ask a follow-up to it? Sure, it's been David's call. Thanks, Mr. Smith. So a follow-up to Fred's question, is there no attorney's free attorney in this type of lawsuit? I mean, I know it depends on the, what you're suing. That's correct. There's no, in part of federal claims, they don't award attorneys fees to be successful. Yes, that is correct. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Olentel. I have a follow-up question to that one. Did, we didn't put that in our contract with Mirad that we could recover attorney's fees in case of breach? No. Okay. Sure, Mr. Constant. So this whole thing started when the quote community MOA entered into an agreement with Merritt. Was that a willing decision? How did that decision get made to hand over the reins to a state, a federal entity? <clears throat> there was a extended process. Uh, at the time, some federal money had become available for the project. We needed a lead federal agency to oversee disposition of those funds. There was uh, initial efforts to work with the Corps of Engineers, but there was significant delay <coughs> before they could take on the project. So there was an effort to locate another federal agency. Maritime Administration uh, was identified. There were negotiations that occurred. There was meetings with the assembly. The contract was approved by the assembly. Um, and it got going with the full process involved. So if we could at some point, I would like to have a record of that negotiation, how that worked from the assemblies, the votes we took, how we were briefed. That would be great to have that information. We've gathered all that up. I can make it. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Mr. Dyson. Yeah, Bob. Um, so during, I think this was during the tail end of the Wards administration. Yeah. yeah, so just previous to that time when the federal money came available and we're looking to core or Merritt, what had the city done before the municipality? We had an engineering society, cost benefit things. There had been a master plan developed in 1999 there had been some design work on a different design, a tile supported deck. Uh, and those uh, efforts had been, were partially underway and in, in the plan at the time. And then uh, subsequently, the, uh, with under Mayor Wurch, the decision was made to look at other alternatives and a number of different designs were considered <coughs> as part of the process for getting the environmental impact work done. And of the various designs that were considered, this, the OCSP was the one that was recommended. And 
what part did our bases here play in the availability of the federal money? There's substantial DOD money. It was part of the uh, strategic port initiative that enabled DOD money to be used as well. Uh, Jay Bear also participated in uh, providing material sites. We developed a back road access to Jay Bear and it gave us access to materials so a lot of gravel came off of their site. That was a significant contribution to the project and to the military health. And, and I think the other gentleman said that with the federal money, we really had to have a federal agency involved. And did they have to manage the whole pro project design and execution in order to qualify for that federal money? I don't know the answer to whether that had to be the way it was. I just know that's the way it was set up. Yeah, yeah thank you. Well, Mr. Ahead, Smith. Jason. Well, what, what I was going to say, and, and just to supplement what Mr. Owen said, when federal dollars were allocated to this project under the federal acquisition regulations, which are the implementing regs that allow the federal government to, to purchase goods and services, the project did in fact have to be managed, uh, at least in the way that they were allocated for this project, had to be managed by a federal agency because uh, unless they're done through a direct grant, the federal agency and the federal government actually has to be involved. The contracting officer has to be put in place to make sure that the federal government receives what it's paying for. Thank you. Good questions and good answers, darn it. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. So I have a few more uh, folks in the queue, and then I'd like us to uh, move on to the next portion of our meeting. So Mr. Uh, Peterson, Ms. Alatone, and Mr. Funston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So. You mentioned a 1999 study and a design that we were actually working on, and eventually that design was not used, and, and so we switched to the one that turned out to be effective. Had, had we stayed with that original design, would, would that have been? Would we have been successful in, in rebuilding the port with that design that we came up with in 1999? Do we know that? I don't know enough about that design or how far it had gotten or the detail of it to be able to decide. I know Cook Inlet is a very difficult place to build anything. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Just all the time. Thank you. Um, I am a new member, uh, Mr. Smith, but can you give me just the net, like the super short version of the primary defense asserted by Mirad? Well, there's been there's been several. Um, I think the primary defense is that um, there's a legal defense. They're contending that they didn't have any duty under the agreement that was entered into between the municipality and the Maritime Administration to actually administer the project on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we obviously don't agree with that. And we've elicited during depositions during the fact discovery phase. Uh, quite a bit of testimony from both their witnesses and our own that contradict that defense. But that appears to be the primary challenge that the Maritime Administration uh, has asserted in the case. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. I just, would, in the interest of time, like to take us to the next stage, which would be a motion to adjourn into executive session. And so I know that we need a, a conversation with our attorneys before we make that move. And so I would like to hand it to them to do that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson. So uh, we have uh, two different items that we will be discussing in executive session. Uh, first, uh, this uh, Marion lawsuit, and second, the Henry litigation. Um, so, Ms. Ennis, could you please lay the foundation for both of those items? Yeah, certainly. The administration seeks to update the assembly on matters relating to, to these two pieces of litigation, the Maritime Administration litigation just discussed, and also a second matter, Henry v. MOA, an employment termination matter. Uh, we are both in ongoing litigation at the present time. The public disclosure of matters to be discussed could undermine the municipality's position and cause an adverse effect upon the finances of the municipality. 
Thank you. Um, so uh, seeing and hearing that public disclosure would undermine the municipality's position, uh, Madam Vice Chair, could we please have a motion to move into executive session? Let's start with the mayor ad, um, lawsuit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to go into executive session to discuss pending maritime administration litigation as described by the municipal attorney. Second. For the purpose of discussion, I would like to add to the record, according to uh, the municipal attorney, Ms. Wynn Pearson, that as members of the assembly who have duly contracted with consultants to help us manage and understand the ramifications of this overall process that we are able and legally eligible to bring in our consultants. And so we do intend to have at least three members of their team to participate in this executive session with us so that when we are making our uh, analysis, we have full competent skills with us. Um, Madam Clerk, should we do a roll call vote or just unanimous? Um, I think you you can see, you can do a unanimous vote. That would be fine, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, anyone opposed uh, to going into executive dis uh, session to discuss the maritime uh, lawsuit? Okay, seeing none, uh, that motion passes. Um, Madam Vice Chair. I move to go into executive session to discuss the Henry litigation as described by the municipal attorney. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Are any members opposed uh, to going into executive session to discuss the Henry litigation? Oh, sorry. 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 Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so moved and seconded. Uh, any opposed to that motion? Okay. Seeing none, uh, that motion passes to go into executive session to discuss, to, to discuss the Henry litigation.